Hello everybody, welcome to What Would Your Idea World Be? A new podcast which examines many important people and the important things in their lives, what they think about the most current trends at the moment, what they think about certain subject matters, and of course, what their ideal world would be. As part of a special series of episodes we're having looking at and covering the London mayoral elections, today's guest will be Valerie Brown, a long-time standing activist, working with many groups, especially on the on causes like environmentalism, of which has included her working with Central Rebellion, of which has led to some legal trouble more recently. She's running for the position under the Burning Pink Party banner. Hello, Edward. Hello, how are you? I'm all right. I don't know what happened there, but um, I was sort of wandering around everywhere trying to get connection. Okay. So I'm going to place myself in yep. my chair. Yep. Is that okay? Yeah, that's is fine, light, yeah. How is the light? Because obviously I've got quite a lot of direct sunlight. Yeah, it, it looks fine. It's a little bright, but it, it's, you can be seen. It's fine, it's fine. Ah, uh-huh. okay. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, thank you for coming on. And I just wanted to start by asking you, you've just been elected as the Mayor of London. You just entered City Hall and are getting used to your surroundings. What is the first major policy that you work on and why? Well, I have one policy, which is that I want to put London in the hands of Londoners. I want London to be a city run by its citizens. So that would be the first thing, is to install um, citizens' assemblies, workable citizens' assemblies, binding citizens' assemblies, but it has to be with the help of the government. The government has to accept that if the people vote for me, that's the mandate to run London in this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, where did this idea for running London as a series of citizens' assemblies come from? Ah, yes. The thing is that, you know, for far too long, we can just, we're living a life where things don't change and actually possibly getting worse. It's not easy to say about our politicians that they're not taking care of us. We're not the priority. It seems as if their interest is with corporations and people at the top. There's so many people in London. Most people in London are quite poor. And when you go around London, you see poverty that has existed and is getting worse over decades. I think during the Labour Party, um, Tony Blair's um, Labour Party, um, there was some sense that things were going to change. And yes, the Labour Party did put some money into ordinary people's lives. But obviously we know what went wrong there. And since then we've had the Conservatives in. But for me, whether it's Labour or Conservative, there's an intrinsic um, problem with politicians and party politics because it's not going to the roots of problems. So they're just tinkering with just small issues when there are huge matters that need to be addressed and they've never been able to do this radically. So I feel very strongly that it's time that people took control of their own lives. People know what they need, they're smart, they're sensitive to one another. You go into communities, and actually the poorer communities especially, you see, despite all the the stories of crime and all sorts of things, that actually people care about one another. And it's this caring for one another that needs to grow across London. And I believe it can do that through citizens' assemblies. Because if I may say that citizens' assemblies is a structure of democracy, which brings people together from all walks of life, and it works, because when people are in close proximity to each other, they listen, they learn from one another. They're not entrenched in their own selfish way of thinking or narrow way of thinking, because we're all human and we only know the lives that we live, but we get a chance to see other people's lives and that's transformative from all corners. Mm-hmm. Uh, what huge problems do you feel that the current uh, crop of politicians are ignoring then in favour of what you call small issues then? That they're tinkering with. Sorry, is oh. it okay? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like what huge issues do you think they're ignoring? What huge problems do you think they're dodging, do you think then? Yes. Well, 
the biggest issue of all is the climate crisis. They're not talking about that. They're not talking about the urgency of it. And they actually lie about it. They lie about Britain's um, carbon emissions, how much we're progressing towards reaching certain goals. This is not true. So the fear and the absolute terror that is waiting, I mean, obviously in parts of the world, people are already experiencing it. So therefore we know that there is a climate crisis which is coming our way. We don't have to just not care about, you know, globally other people who are going through this. I want to hear politicians talking about this as if it's something that we all have to get involved in. And they at the top have to start setting the agenda as to how we're going to mitigate something that is never going to be, we're never going to stop it, but we can stop it from reaching its worst um, effects, the worst impacts of it. But then also it's the divide between um, communities. I mean, why should some people be perpetually living in poverty or the amount of, I mean, the lack of housing? And this is not about big housing projects to house, you know, well-off people in fancy apartments. This is about taking existing empty homes, turning them into affordable, properly affordable homes for people who have very little and for people who are homeless. Why are there this one person in, in 52 uh, people in London who are homeless? This doesn't make any sense. This is not a poor country. So that's one of the things. I mean, the escalating food prices is another thing. The fact that young people don't have any faith in politics and politicians. We're talking about youth who have their lives ahead of them, but they've lost hope. They've lost belief in those people who are in charge of making decisions about our lives. This is terrible and we shouldn't accept it as normal. We need to do something about it. And because the politicians have never really addressed this, there's a lot of talk, but no real action. There's no real empathy. And I think that their values are pretty askew. I think that the people of London, being who they are, the diversity of London needs to be addressed. And people coming together is finding the right solutions that work for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you talk about in your manifesto, if you don't mind me moving on to that, that your politics were inspired by the cultural uprising of sort of like the new left in the 1960s. Were there any particular events or people that shaped your politics from this? Yes, I mean, I grew up in London in the 60s and it was an inspiring time because at that time, um, the working classes started to gain confidence that they could aspire to something. And in fact, there was a lot of respect for working class people, obviously, you know, brought about by bands like the Rolling Stones, um, the Beatles, and all those young bands who came from nothing and rose to play an important part in our cultural history and made enormous waves and actually carried incredibly important messages for people. Um, obviously, in America, we had people like Martin Luther King. We also had um, um, Bobby Kennedy, who is one of my heroes. I mean, going back into, uh, into the 1970s, we had people like President Carter, who actually said that the power should be in the hands of the people. You don't hear people, uh, politicians talking like that now. We had philosophers like Bertrand Russell, who were prepared to go to prison for, for change. And obviously not so long before then, you know, because it's still in, in our uh, present memory, there are people like the suffragettes, there are people um, like the trade unions who fought for, for um, their right to, to be paid properly and have good working conditions. There was a lot going on and some change was manifested, but, it was more, most of it was cultural change. We now have to get to the roots of the matter, which is the political system that we live in. Why do you think all of the change was mainly cultural as opposed to political then, do you think? 
Yes, because we didn't manage to change the system itself. And actually, as time has gone on, um, the capitalism, consumerism, the idea that even that, you know, wherever, in fact, what the movement that ordinary people started, that ordinary people could make a change, actually morphed into something used by corporations and, and, pol and politicians to say that, oh, you know, look at, you know, um, sort of some particular person, they came from a working class background, but now, you know, they've got loads of money and they're successful. You can do it as well. So the culture that anybody can make something of themselves became the, um, the, the philosophy of many decades, but actually it's not true because the system is the same and it's actually um, has in, created this situation where um, we are manipulated by businesses, by companies into thinking that we can buy our way into happiness. That, you know, if you manage to buy yourself a pair of Nike trainers or, or the latest iPhone, you know, even though it means that, you know, you've used every penny you've got and borrowed from the bank, that if you can bandy this around, that you are actually in the system of, of thriving, that you can move out of poverty because you can buy something shiny. And this is actually what has happened to people that we don't understand that buying stuff or being able to own something because some famous person has it, it's not it because you're still poor, you're still struggling. And then there's the matter of the education system itself um, without, um, taking up too much time on that, but that's all wrong. Um, it's not a matter of people going to um, sort of mediocre universities and managing to scrape together some mediocre um, degree. There are all ways in which people can work and working with your hands as it used to be in apprenticeships and so on should be promoted because not only is that more achievable, but it actually can be more rewarding for people because they might be doing something they care about, not aspiring always to be um, one of those people like bankers or um, working in, in, in a corporation that in itself is um, successful, but you are at the bottom rung of it. You get paid very little. So being part of it is not helping your life at all. I hope I'm answering your questions. I, no, I did. No, fine. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I wanted to ask you was like um, on the subject of climate change and um, whatnot. You call the um, the matter of climate change uh, quote eco an ec ecological and social collapse that the corporate class is driving us towards. Who is this corporate class that you speak of, and how do you plan to reduce their influence in London to combat climate change? Well, the fact that banks like Barclays can continue to invest and take money also from companies that use carbon to create their industries and pollute the atmosphere, damaging the planet. Um, the fact is that big companies are also very persuasive through advertising and a whole um, massive structure of persuading people to buy, that buying is what life is about. So it means that it's a constant um, industry, an industry which is about manufacture, manufacture, and this manufacturing is destroying the world. They just want money for themselves. It's, it's a culture built on greed, which has got worse and worse because this um, aspiration. People actually look up to people who are filthy rich. You know, in the um, the 90s especially, you know, say, as Black Americans found their voice through rap music and a, a whole load of success, imagine all the showing off about how much money they had, you know, how many, what big houses. I mean, their, their television programs dedicated to showing the ordinary people how rich people have these amazing homes. 
So our values are all wrong. And this is perpetuated by rich people, corporations who just want money for themselves at the cost of the lives of ordinary people. I don't know if, if I'm making myself clear, but it's a whole um, structure of society and aspiration which has gone immensely wrong. We're not thinking about what is good for the ordinary people to actually give meaning to people's lives. This is really important. People are becoming increasingly more depressed because everything is hollow and they're still poor. And um, from that, what would uh, you do as mayor? What would the citizens assemblies do in order to sort of like change this culture or change sort of like the policies which have led to this point? What is wonderful about citizens assemblies and in a way it's about like my own journey um, in the last couple of years since I fully woke up. I was always aware, but it's a complete awakening um, to what's really going on. My journey um, of awakening has also meant that I've had to educate myself, become better informed. Citizens' Assembly is by nature. It means that when the Assembly is gathered together for deliberation, they have experts who give them um, a very um, a different opinions, right? Different expert opinions on one subject. So they're not just hearing one person banging on about what they think is right, okay? But different opinions, different ways of looking at the same issue. So they become educated during this process. When they sit down to talk to one another, they're getting different life experiences, um, you know, coming at them from all sides. They're having to think about how their decision is going to impact everybody. And it's from a place of information of people sharing ideas from their own life experience and what they know about the issues. I mean, this is transformative. This is going deep into issues that matter to people, not just knee jerk response or just a politician saying, hey, you voted me in like three years ago. Um, I'm going to do this, I'm gonna do that because you voted me in. So you're stuck with whatever I think should be done. It's just really wrong. People are bright. People have deep concerns. And I'm telling you that but as I go around London, it just breaks my heart to see that how I grew up when I was a kid, back in Labra Grove. I grew up in a slum, right? Why are there still slums here? Why are people not being looked after? There's got to be a reason for it. We have governments. Why haven't they addressed this? Why is it that parts of London are so shiny and clean and, you know, just wonderful to walk around in, very uplifting? And then you go to other parts and you see people struggling. I met a man the other day and he said to me that um, he can only eat once a day because he, he works, he's always worked, but he doesn't have enough money to buy, to eat three times a day, just once. This is absolutely wrong and unnecessary. So who's gonna change this? Not the people who've been in power for decades of our lives. It has to be the people. And then uh, on that, actually, explain how your idea of abolishing the position of London mayor and replacing it with citizens' assemblies would work and how that would be better for Londoners now than the current status quo. Well, yes, I'm campaigning to be mayor, but I don't want power. I'm just an ordinary person and I'm definitely not a politician. So the thing is that um, setting up citizens' assemblies means that the, the issues that the London mayor is responsible for, transport and, and housing and so on, will now be in the hands of the people through citizens' assemblies to make the changes, to implement the changes that are necessary. So the decision, the policy making will be by the people, not by the mayor. So you're getting down to grassroots. And when I say grassroots, 
It's not that anybody's going to be left out because the well, well off people are also citizens of London, but it just means that the vast majority of people whose voices have not been heard, who've been neglected, get to sit at the table of decision-making along with everybody else. So everyone gets to speak and be heard. So the policies are shaped by the people. They're decided upon by the people. One of the important factors of this, and this I ask of Londoners, that whatever decisions that they make through their deliberation process has to be in absolute respect to what is happening with our planet. And everything we do cannot damage the, the planet anymore, but rather to start a process of repairing damage Mm -hmm. And uh, when you talk about this uh, idea, like who, um, when you talk about with ordinary Londoners, like um, what's the response that you generally get when you discuss this idea? Is it usually a positive one or? So before I answer that, I just forgot to say that the, the money that the, the mayor of London is given to, to run London, the, the decision of how that money is spent also has to be decided upon by the people. This is really important. So it's not a matter of the money being siphoned into other areas. Also, one other thing is that citizens' assemblies is not open to corruption. Um, ask me again. Oh yeah, in terms of like, um, is it usually a positive response you get in terms of discussing this idea? Is it oh citizens' assemblies? Yes. Um, everything was fairly theoretical until we started campaigning um, just a few weeks ago. The response is beyond my wildest dreams. Young people, especially, um, are just overwhelmed, embracing the idea that they have this chance to vote, to be heard, to make real changes in their lives, to put meaning into their lives, to be able to direct the path that the future takes. Um, it's been an incredible experience for me and absolutely inspiring. I know that this is right for London. It's right for young people. A lot has been taken away from them. And without, um, you know, putting my viewpoint um, too much in the, in the foreground, because this is not what it's about, but just that I know that Londoners did by, by and large, did not vote for Brexit, okay? It's not a matter of what I think, it's how the vote went. So young Londoners probably would have preferred to stay in the EU. It probably worked better for them. They like to get around, you know, the movement of life choices and so on. But older people who've enjoyed the open market, you know, now decide to shut it down and do something different. I'm not sure that that's fair, but that's another matter. Um, certainly, I would say that um, I've been in many poor areas and people are clamoring to hear more about citizens' assemblies. They are on board and they actually write the script for me as I'm trying to talk. They know that this is right for them. And then what is most important is that the sort of middle classes, and I've spoken to people who are super posh and I stopped them and I want to know what they think. And they say the government has to be brought down because politicians are corrupt and they're not looking after the people. And these are people whose lives are comfortable, but they don't like the lies. They don't like the fact that, you know, other people are suffering, that there's this unbelievable divide because London is an amazing city. It can be, right? The diversity, the creativity has to be harnessed but it can only work if people feel that there is a forward trajectory and that they're being heard, that they, they feel that there is hope, that there is a chance for them to see something happen. I mean, hope is very important, but having said that, we also know that hope is not something that just happens. We all have to take part in creating this. And that's the beauty of it all, is getting people involved. People want to be involved. That's why COVID has shown that the ordinary people want to make decisions, want to help their communities, right? They want to be part of making things work better. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of something you talked about earlier, 
um, you opine in your manifesto about how committed to the truth you are uh, in terms of like political stuff. Uh, do you feel that then that, that truth of fact have declined as factors in our current political system then? Okay. Um, how I became an activist, although I don't like labels, I never put labels on myself because um, in my life, I just feel that I'm me and my individuality was always very important to me. But I will say now, uh, because it's important, that I became an activist um, in April, the end of April um, 2019. I was very, very impressed by the rebellion that took place because I myself was in absolute grief because I started to understand um, the catastrophe that we're living in and which is going to go get far, far worse which threatens the future of a generation to the point where of societal collapse, of starvation, you know, of lack of, of water, of the planet burning, a heat that's intolerable for human beings to live under. At that point, I saw Theresa May, now I have to say that I have daughters, I have grandchildren, and I have been in grief. I was in grief for their future. I was literally like crying very often. And then I heard Theresa May announce on television that we were in a climate emergency. This was music to my ears. Finally, I thought, our government is taking this seriously. Now we're going to start the process of reparation to save the future for the children. I felt ecstatic. Then a few days later, she came on the television again and she said um, that she was supporting the expansion of the Heathrow Airport with the third runway. This is totally incompatible with the government that's saying that we are in a climate emergency. More planes flying in the air means more carbon emissions hastening the damage, the catastrophe that we're already facing. This is no shining light to other countries like China who are not doing their bit for the, for the planet or Russia. And then I think maybe yeah, Trump was in power. My God, you know, we needed a country like Britain, which has always set itself up to be so, so righteous in its thinking. Um, I think that Britain has created a bit of a myth very successfully about itself. But when you look at the history of Britain, and I have to say this, right, is that it has, it has gone around the world creating immense damage. I mean, going around just putting a stake in someone's country and saying, this is now our country, it belongs to us. All your resources are now ours. You are under our rule, <laughs> that is madness. And you know, nobody has ever really apologized for this terrible domination of, of other people's countries. What right has this country to do that? But it's been quite accepted. And now what do we find? Britain is saying that, you know, there is no racism. I myself will say that Despite racism, the culture of racism, and it's not just a culture, it's a political system, right? I also believe that as a human being, I can also rise above that with determination, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And not everybody's like me, right? People have different lives. I might have grown up in a poor environment, but something within me, or maybe something my parents gave me, gave me this other outlook on life to believe in myself. So Britain is responsible for a lot, and, but it's got to understand that it's got a lot of change to make to get the world or to get itself on a good path, to recognize that it has created suffering within its own country. Even British people were subjugated by their governments and by their elite. They had to fight for freedom, as you know, the women had to fight, the poor people had to fight, but let's end the fighting, let's end the protests. 
People shouldn't have to take to the streets just for normal life to be able to exist. So that's why I don't believe that politicians can help us. Their, their focus is not on change. They don't want to lose the comfortable lifestyles. And maybe it's not even like um, they are totally aware. Let's face it, you know, if you are born into um, a family that's quite comfortable and it's often extremely comfortable, you've had generations where people have been very comfortable. You go to the best schools, you go to the best universities, life flows very easily for you. You know, everyone suffers, of course, in life. You know, you might lose a, a, a family member or you might be ill or something like that. But the kind of suffering that poor people go through, which is just trying to pay their rent, get money to buy food, educate their children, you know, buy clothes for them, you have a roof over their heads, is not something that most politicians know anything about. They go straight from these hallowed um, institutions straight into parliament. What life experience have they had? So, you know, I don't blame them in a way for not being able to take care of people because they don't understand. I probably don't understand the lives that they've lived or some other people, but by getting together in certain assemblies, we have this amazing chance to get to know one another and what it is that we all need to make London a city that's fair, you know, and beautiful for all people. We can make it a city on hope and an economy that is working for everybody. And I'd like to also say that over some time now, we don't even talk about countries. I mean, when politicians are talking um, and campaigning and so on, they don't seem to have a vision. Vision is something that's huge and it's, it's embedded in, in philosophy. Um, I don't hear that. All I ever hear is the word economy. It's like the whole world is just about that. But you can't have a, a good economy if you don't have good values. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. The economy cannot work for everybody if the values are all wrong. So I want to hear politicians talk about something meaningful, how they see the world in a way that people are, are thriving materially, spiritually, with hope and joy and love for one another. All these things that really matter. They talk about other countries now as economies. No, they're not economies. They're countries where people live, people have aspirations, they have dreams, and they have hardships that need to be looked after. Mm -hmm. uh, on, top, on, on that, actually, uh, you openly admit in your manifesto that you and your party, Burning Pink, are, quote, anti-politics and hate politics. Would it be fair to say that from that you are thereby an anarchist organization? And if so, why are you competing in this contest? Is there no other means, perhaps, that you can achieve this? Or is it just, um, yeah, well, explain that to me if that's OK. OK. Um... The word anarchy, I think, refers to people who don't have respect, regard, and want to pull down um, the institutions of, of government, right? Mm -hmm. um, in a way, I think that the government are anarchists themselves because they are destroying um, a system which perhaps was flawed in the first place because it was created by educated and wealthy people, but it was meant to be for all people by giving people the vote, the vote meaning the right to, to have a say in what goes on. But the fact that we don't have a say because of all the lies um, and the disregard for the majority of people in this country, um, the disregard for the mental well-being of people, the spiritual well-being of people, by not promoting companies to keep on just wanting people to walk down Oxford Street and buy rubbish that they don't need, that for me is actually quite anarchic um, towards the people. But as for burning pink, the reason we um, have no regard for the, the, the politicians and government 
and want to bring down the government is the fact that, and we do this obviously by rebelling. Who didn't rebel? When didn't people have to rebel to create change? It's always been like that. From your own history, the, the, the Pol Pot, whatever, martyrs, the suffragettes, um, the civil rights movement, the rebellions in South Africa, the youth rebellions of the, of the 60s, um, the rebellions of the 70s. People have always had to rebel. But what I feel is that rebellion has to stop because it's very, very stressful for us. We don't want to have to go to prison. We don't want to be um, attacked by police because we don't agree with things that our government um, is doing. We just want to get on with building lives that make us happy, that work, that puts food on our table and make us give meaning to our lives. And furthermore, to save the future for our children, the all important factor of all our lives right now, the focus. And to save the future, we have to change everything. If governments don't promote big business, as the holy grail, the meaning of all our world, then we start to change the way we work. We bring in these green economies, which means supporting smaller businesses, but it's also giving people jobs that, I mean, because a green economy is actually an opportunity to build, I mean, for let me use the dirty word in my books, economy, to build a strong economy because we need it. If we need it, then it's going to make money for the country and for everybody, right? Everybody will be working because there's a lot of work to do to sort out all the damage and to create new industries. And I think that people will feel very energized when they know that the work they're doing is for the good of this planet, the good of all. Mm -hmm. And in terms of this um, system that you want to create, are there any... Um... Uh, countries or other systems politically that you take inspiration from in terms of uh, adapting it to London? Um, I do actually like, I know it's a rich country, but I, I like the way Denmark is run. Um, for example, they cap um, house prices, rental prices. There is a cap on that. So they want to make sure that people can afford to rent homes and buy homes. I think that's very noble. Um, there's, there's, uh, everything is kept smaller. It's not a matter of big companies, you know, the sort of the Zara's and the um, whatever, you know, uh, big companies taking control of the, the sort of shopping industry, the market. They encourage small businesses to be on their high streets and so on. I think that's very important, encouraging local businesses they do that very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, also world, I mean, as you know, I mean, there are countries, I mean, cities like say Madrid, um, the, the run by, by a woman mayor, um, New Zealand run by a woman mayor, Angela Merkel um, leading um, Germany. She's done a good job. It's not perfect because it's still embedded in the same system. Um, but she's certainly much more um, right thinking. Um, Britain needs to start thinking deeply about what it stands for. Mm -hmm. And the people do this themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that, um, uh, um, your campaign, you talk about how um, by you plan to use, yeah, our work is to end the current cl climate crisis that encompasses the globe by using sort of these people's assemblies. How would um, people's assemblies uh, do a better job of solving the current climate crisis than say the mayor would right now, if you don't mind me asking? Well, for example, um, I do think that uh, citizens' assemblies would not be voting in or deciding, not voting, but deciding on um, construction companies, big business, um, destroying people's homes, already existing homes, and building new high-rise blocks, like say what's happened in Wandsworth, 
where swathes of Wandsworth have been decimated to build expensive homes for well-off people. The people don't like it, they've campaigned against it, but they haven't been listened to. It's also broken up their communities. And then there are loads of empty homes. They're just waiting for somebody with money, maybe from another country, to come and buy them. And the people still don't have um, homes to live in. So that's an example. The whole HS2 business, I know that's across England, but the thing is that, you know, 82% of the country didn't want this, right? And people have been protesting in London, you know, as you know, they've gone under the ground to show their absolute commitment to stopping the HS2 project. You know, some 200 billion pounds is proposed to go into this project. What can 200 billion do for the people? Do you really think that the people of London would rather have a, a, a rail service that cuts you know, a journey by 20 minutes, mainly for people who are already very comfortable because they can travel around like this, you know, rather than have that money put into their housing needs and you know, structures. I mean, even things like you know, uh, sort of refuse, having their, their areas cleaned up properly so it's more pleasant to walk around, you know, more green and so on, and jobs as well for people put money into local businesses and let the people create their own um, economy, strengthen their lives. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I believe um, that the people would decide on different issues differently. Mm -hmm. And also they're not bound to please their party either. There is no party to please, just one another. Would you um, then uh, support, for example, uh, initiatives by these uh, citizens' assemblies? We should talk about housing being bought up by foreign, like oligarchs and stuff like that. Would you then mm -hmm. support, like, moves to sort of ban, say, uh, these foreign oligarchs from buying um, housing in London, for example? Absolutely. I mean, I support whatever the people want, but in my opinion, um, I think that's the right thing to do because we know how dramatically it's pushed um, a, a house prices up, you know. So people are, if people are gaining rich, it means that it pushes house prices up for those who already have homes and so on. But the people who don't, who have, who live in areas that are not sort of deemed um, sort of cool places to live, don't benefit and they don't want to either because it's just wrong. You know, I mean, when you get areas like, say, um, Hoxton in the east, where young people, you know, um, whenever 20 years ago or more, 20 years ago, discovered that they could um, take over, you know, for cheap rents, all the warehouses and all the houses in the east. And they started to build this amazing um, community of, of young people who could have homes and started creating wonderful jobs and cafes and, and you know, clothes shops and businesses and so on. And when it started to look cool, what happened? The big corporations moved in and all the prices went up and basically priced them out of these areas into more remote areas of London. So keeping things small and for the people so the people can create industry themselves is the right way. And pe foreign people coming and, and buying up swathes of London, homes and so on, and also leaving them empty is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And a government allowing this to happen because they benefit and their cronies benefit, the people who they care about, is just wrong and has to change. That's why systemic change and London being run by citizens, citizens' assemblies is the beginning of systemic change, which this country needs and the world needs. Mm -hmm. I want London to be this light for other cities and other countries, because if we don't do this, and I believe that London is a perfect place because actually we've shown in the past that we are rebellious, and we can affect change, but we just need to take that change deeper mm -hmm. to make a difference.
Sure. And what moves would you uh, also make either as mayor or your citizens' assemblies would make, or the citizens' assemblies on their own, to um, sort of curb or reduce the foreign investment in the housing market in London we currently have? Well, I mean, I think that it has to go through the citizens' assemblies to make decisions whether we want to sell um, London homes to, to foreign investors and how do we benefit? Maybe even if we do sell it, maybe there's a way that the people can benefit from it. Although I, I, I'm very, you know, um, I, sorry, but I don't think that that's really possible. But, you know, maybe there's another way. If they want to bring their money to London, then the people of London have to, to benefit from it. The people at the bottom of, of, of society, not the people at the top. And you talk but about other way. That's the point. And you talk about like London possibly being an inspiration to the rest of the world as to how to do citizens' assemblies and so on. Like, um, so what place you think could be uh right? What, yeah. Um, do you have like other contacts of political people in other areas around the world who want to also attempt to build citizens' assemblies and want to use sort of your template of London if you get elected as a base model? Yes. Um, Iceland is um, actually in the process of, dis yeah, they're discussing citizens' assemblies. Um, I think Amsterdam as well is already implementing some measures of citizens' assemblies. Um, sorry, but I can't remember, there's another country in Europe, I think it's Sweden. It's not, it hasn't implemented citizens' assemblies yet, but they're using the idea of asking citizens to make the policy decisions, which then the government implements. But because the, decision, um, the citizens' assemblies don't have that binding um, power, so I'm not sure how that's working, but it's, it's gaining traction. And you know it's been used even actually um, after um, the election in America, they use citizens' assemblies to talk about the outcomes of the election in America. And um, I've seen a video of it. And at the beginning of the video, um, there are people in the assemblies who are clearly sort of Trump supported types because you have to represent the whole country, right? Mm -hmm. There were black people in it. And to begin with, there was this horrible aggression and sort of distasteful way of talking, especially to the black people in the assemblies. Um, this is normal for the way people live in, in many countries, especially America. Um, at the end of that um, Citizens' Assemblies, I saw those same people who did look like and sound like Trump supporters actually move over to the black people and hug them. And they said, I have learned so much and I understand that we're all human beings and I have, we need to understand one another. And this was what they came away with. How powerful is that? Mm -hmm. And um, in, sorry. in the wake of the elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you is like, um, do you think that the main reason that people prefer sort of like are getting more increasingly involved in uh, citizens' assemblies and supporting them is mainly just because of a total collapse in confidence in the current political system and wanting something radically different? There is no doubt that that's what's happened. And it's not something I'm celebrating at all. You know, it does mean asking people in London to step up. We can no longer just um, complain about the government. You know, we can stand in, in supermarket queues and get into conversations about how shit the whole thing is and that governments don't care about us and, and rising prices in food and, and so on. We now need to do something about it. So this is a platform, this is a structure for the people of London, not just to complain, but to take control and start to shape their lives the way they need to. People are disillusioned and it's not just because, sorry, you can barely see me the, the way the light is. It's not just about um, what's happened during this past year with COVID. COVID has only heightened the incompetence of the government and the fact that the government always puts the economy before the people, before what is right. They can afford to take care of the people until the pandemic is, is um, manageable, but they didn't. And so the, the, the pandemic ran out of, out of control 
and kill far more people than it needed to. The same thing is happening with the climate crisis. The same thing is going to happen because they will not address this. Millions of people are going to die because the government would rather keep up the old economy, the same economy um, that has destroyed the planet. They'd rather get back to that as soon as possible. This is their return to normal. We cannot have that. I mean, I've, I I've hope that a lot of Londoners, I hope a lot of people in the world understand that what is destroying our society is exactly this so-called normal. We cannot have it. The normal has to be that people have the control, the decision-making power, that we start making the right decisions for all our lives so that everybody gets a fair um, platform to speak and say what they need, what needs to be done. And most of all, that what needs to be done is also to take care of the future for our children. And this is why I'm here. I'm not here because I'm interested in, I mean, I've never had any politi political um, ambition. In fact, literally like a couple of weeks before the, the idea of me running for mayor um, came to um, my attention or my life, my mind, I was thinking, who would want to be a politician? It's just such a horrible job. You know, it's such a, um, also a burden in a way to, to live your life like this. But obviously the burden is too great for them to be able to take an all encompassing view of, of shaping a city or a country. But the people can do that because our hearts will be in the right place. And also people will be informed, well informed about all the different ways that one subject, one issue can be looked at. And with this information, they can make the right decisions without having to think about the sort of party political pressures that politicians, and also personal ambition of politicians. It will just work better. Okay, the, my next question, if you don't mind me asking, uh, is that you have previously been arrested several times, including for property damage last year and chronic front mistake. And you describe yourself as a vigilante in your manifesto alongside being a grandmother and an activist. From that, how would you convince voters who to support you in your campaign who may like your policies but find that such a record might make them feel slightly queasy, if you don't mind me asking? Okay, there's nothing to feel queasy about. Um, and I address this mainly to women, but also to men, that if the suffragettes had not broken the law, they broke glass, they put their, their freedom in, in, at risk so that women could get something as basic as a vote. If they had not done that, women, I mean, I don't know what it would have taken for women to get the vote, maybe, um, actions and protests far worse than even um, what the suffragettes did because women would have become really angry. The same goes for um, the civil rights movement. So we have to break the law because the, the law, the government, the people in power do not listen to us. They don't want to. I mean, right, people have spent 30, 40 years writing to governments all over the world, writing to companies, the oil companies and their governments, to warn them, scientists have told them, we're in a climate crisis, we're going to lose everything if we don't um, stop burning carbon. People have written tons of articles, books, lectures, the whole lot, and nothing is happening. So then a few people decide, we're going to force you to listen to us. We're going to show the people in our country that they're in a crisis, that they're in trouble massively, right? So by breaking the law, hopefully, the media will pay attention. And it works to some extent, but even the media are not on the side of justice and right, because we know that the media is mainly controlled by, by you know, corporations. Corporations control the government is the cycle which leaves the rest of us just floundering around, you know, heading towards disaster. So yes, I have broken the law. 
I've done it in the name of what is right. I don't want to break the law. I don't want to go to prison. I, I upset my family. I have grandchildren who I'd rather be spending time with. My daughters feel for me. I cannot even discuss what I do with my mother. She's 93 years old and she, she, I don't want to, to frighten her. But I also care about what I'm doing because I want change. So I put myself in this, at this risk and it's extremely stressful. Most um, of these people who protest and break the law, they have breakdowns. They get depressed because the pressure on them is so huge. So I'm begging people listening to this podcast that the more of us, and I'm not asking anybody to break the law, but when it comes to getting on the streets to protest or whichever way, make your voice heard, that you support these activists because they are giving up so much to support and create a better life for all of us. Respect that, love them for this because it just ain't easy. Right. Yeah. This is one of the last couple of questions I'm going to ask you. Um, yes. If you don't win this position uh, for London Mayor, what do you plan for your political future? Do you plan on running for other political offices? Do you, would you run for Parliament, for example, or London Mayor again, or London Assembly, for example? I want to say that for me, time is not on our side for all of us collectively. We have to make bold decisions now because things are very bad. Um, people are suffering. There's too much poverty, too much homelessness, too much suicide, too much mental um, stress, and too much climate and ecological and societal collapse around the world, okay? There isn't time. So we have to make these bold decisions now. Four years from now, first of all, it's just exhausting and I'm quite old. Um, Let's not hang about. I don't even want to contemplate that. I want the change now. And everybody should want the change now. We've hung around too long, wasting time, whilst you know the world has been led into a tragic place for all of us, a place that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's um, my answer. Uh, the penultimate uh, question I wanted to ask you is, is the title of the show, and I ask all my guests it, is what would your ideal world be? Um, my ideal world, there can never be an ideal world anymore. Not like when I was young, when the world seemed uh, more stable and we knew less. So we didn't have all the facts then. But still, as I said, there were rebellions and revolutions which gave us a great sense of hope. I want to see people feel that sense of hope again. And even though we will never get to that place where we can be able to thrive as I envisaged it in my youth. There's been too much damage already done, but we can try still to make the best of a situation that um, has led us, as leading us into danger, into um, climate collapse. But even with that, within that, we have to pull our resources and our strength to make the best world that we can, and we can do it. So basically, I mean, people feeling a sense of hope that there is a reason to get up every day, that there's meaning in their lives. And actually fighting for change gives you a good reason to wake up. And um, I want to see people have some sense of uh, a spiritual fulfillment and I'm not talking about basic or um, you know, religion, but within themselves to feel um, just a sense of fulfillment, a, a peacefulness and working with one another. And dare I say, I'd like to see people love one another. And that's, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of a music, if you see what I mean, sure. yeah. Okay, thank you for coming on, and I'm very glad that you took the time out to come on. And uh, just as a closing thing, uh, if people want to support you or follow your work, uh, how could they find you? Like, what social media or website links do you have? Yes, it's Valerie for London, and the four is the number four. Valerie for London, the burning pink party. 
Okay, <laughs> thank, uh, thank you very much, Valerie, for coming on the show. And yeah, uh, uh, good luck yeah. in your ambitions. And thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. And there are many more of me who have amazing things to say. So you're welcome to invite them too. I was considering. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for coming on. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and share this video, as well as subscribe to the Edward Ed Interviews YouTube channel and also the Ed Interviews BitChute channel, and also look at my stuff on Mixcloud as well. I have more of this content coming in, and also subscribe to my Patreon subscribe store as well for more guests requests, as well as free covers of my old books. Until then, see you next time, guys.